And so the original title, which we're pretty close to realizing here, was called um, uh, Artists to the Side, Experts on Stage. And I want to preface this by saying <laughs> this is unusual for me. Even though I write and write and talk and talk a lot about performing arts and innovation and ideas, uh, when I'm on stage, I'm playing you songs that on Common Ground or Shuba's or once in a while, if somebody thinks of me for something, I'll act, or else I'm on stage working with actors because I direct plays a lot. So that's where I'm coming from with this. And what I'm going to be talking about today are social events that are explicitly and discreetly competing, not just with uh, performing arts events, but with not-for-profit performing arts organizations, um, especially when these organizations do not effectively consider the social aspect of the arts occasions they offer and the works that they produce. So if you're either visiting Chicago or you live here, you could pick up a timeout, you could pick up the reader, you could pick up either the daily papers, the red eye, or you could go online and look at Chicagoist or Gaper's Block or any of these things. And what you're gonna find is that uh, basically culinary experiences are competing with the arts. And I don't hear about this often in any kinds of arts discussions. I don't hear about it when people are talking about supply and demand. I don't hear about it when people are saying, what would people spend $60 on and get a sitter if it's the one night in two months that they're going to go out? Or if they love to go out once a week, what's competing? But if you pick up any of those publications and you look at what's on the front page of the lifestyle section, which would include culture, and things to do on the town. It's very clear that dinner and a show has been replaced by the potential that dinner is a show. This is happening all the time. And the advantage that Charlie Trotter and Grant Aikett and Rick Bayless all have is that you can get a sitter. This can be your one night out. You can go out with people. You can experience the sensory work and the culinary work and actually the experiential detail, talking about experience design, the experiential detail of an arts experience and you can also communicate the whole time. The me and the meal itself not only being the, perf the sensory performance of, of a master, it's also a catalyst for conversation as much as, it's, as it represents standalone pieces of culinary art. And this has been a major shift, the idea that dinner is the show instead of dinner and a show. And it's clearly happening now in Chicago in May 2011. If you don't know already what the hottest ticket in town is, do you know what it is? Like what's the hardest ticket to get in town is to next. And this is Grand Aikens' new restaurant. That, and they came up with the idea about a year or two ago. And f immediately I thought, this is going to make it maybe clear to arts organizations who their competition is. They've come up with a ticketing system. They sell tickets in advance on their website for this restaurant next. They have show times. They actually have a sliding scale based on whether you're having dinner at 6 p.m. on a Thursday or 8 p.m. on a Saturday night. Uh, they deliberately made these, these tickets exchangeable. In the words of the, um, the business partner of the chef, he said in interviews that their model for it was basically baseball tickets and Springsteen tickets. So they aren't talking about hurting not-for-profits, but they're saying that these are, the, these are our models that, we can, that it's legal to resell these tickets. And you can go on Craig, if you want to eat it next tonight, you can do it, but you're going to have to go get on Craigslist, or you're going to have to go to a ticket scalper, and you're going to have to pay $300 for the ticket to dinner tonight. Um, so that's out there, and that's happening. And I feel like it's pretty obvious, so that's really why I'm only going to start talking about that and move on to something else. Because dinner is the show, should be clear to everybody, it's, even if it's not necessarily happening in not-for-profit arts. I'm, I'm guessing for-profit live performance is aware that this is competition. Um, I'm going to read a sentence verbatim because it's a long, complicated sentence. I'll never be able to say it from memory. And as much as I feel that performing arts organizations are just beginning to understand that they're competing with restaurants for audiences and competing to be a noteworthy part of the zeitgeist, not in a superficial, trendy way, but more as an essential part of the social and artistic culture in this decade in this city. As much as arts organizations are finding themselves on the sidelines sometimes of local popular culture, of what you might call the smart set of what they talk about. In the 50s and 60s, the smart set meant you go to a party and you talk about Edward Albee or you talk about Tennessee Williams. If you go to a party now, 
you could bring up Rick Bayless, you could bring up Grant Akitz, and this is a little more of the common language than a Tracy Letts or a show at the Goodman, as much as these are of equal or greater substance. Um, so as much as all that's true, that's not exactly what I'm talking about because my time's gonna be up soon and we can talk about that over dinner somewhere else other than in this building. <laughs> And wherever we go for that, wherever we go, if we go to the park across the street as people did at lunch, or if we go to Epic Burger down the street, the environment of that place is going to get the cr a little bit of credit for whatever great conversations we're gonna have because those are spaces that are designed to include a little bit of conversation. Luckily, somebody thought of me to share their tickets to next to me and I went there and one thing I was aware of, and, it, and it's not exclusive to that place, but part of the attention to detail that restaurants are really aware of and a lot of retail spaces are aware of is an almost negative space that allows interaction and conversation. Now, what can performing arts organizations do? I don't think the solution is tweeting during shows. I don't think the solution is talking back and turning uh, experiences that way. Because I mean, I direct plays and I like a quiet, attentive audience or you know, a noisy, attentive audience. Um, and what I think performing arts organizations need to ask themselves is, how do they compete with that? And does the experience we include offer room for conversation and not conversation during the show, as I'm saying, do they allow room for conversation before and after? You go into most performing arts buildings, whether it's concerts or theaters, you can get in there about a half hour before the show begins, and then the show's over, and if you've ever spent any time talking in a theater after a show, they'll turn on the work lights. And that's kind of the sign that it's like, it's over. You, you must leave the building. Um, is there a social element that performing arts organizations need to be respons take responsibility for, not out of uh, charity or something, but in order to survive, basically? Um, and if there's not a social element at a venue, you know, there's an alternative to a place like this that if Martians came in this building, they would think it was a bank. And that's okay. It's designed this way. It's designed of that era. As Ben Cameron sort of said, it's designed with 19th century values in mind. But this is where actually social networking is, a, is, a, is something that theater companies can invest a little in for a whole lot less than the cost of getting new permits, putting up drywalls, and building some sort of live social space. So if you're in a space that you have to abandon after 15 minutes after the end of it, um, these are companies where if somebody really was moved by something and they want to say something to the company the next day, these are companies that where Facebook and Twitter, et cetera, are ways of um, making up for the lack of social experience in their venue. And, uh, and so that's one option, you know, that, uh, <laughs> you know, that it's like, it, a lot of people, if they see a show, and again, it's like, it's no different, this is where hotels, restaurants, and theaters, and opera houses are all on the same level with this, that it's like, it's basically a dream, a liminal dream kind of situation. And it's not about doing any, it's not about interacting while you're in it, but the day after that, you can have that moment where you say, holy moly. And now in the way that David Lohr tweeted at lunchtime that he had gotten a sandwich from Hannah's Bretzel, which is pretty much the best sandwich place in downtown Chicago, I tweeted to Hannah's Bretzel or no, I tweeted to David, but I put the hashtag for Hannah, or the name for Hannah's pretzel in there, that it's like, oh, you're in for a treat. You picked the right thing. But at three o'clock, Hannah's pretzel had said, thank you, or had said, oh, that's great to hear. Something so that the transaction was completed. Companies aren't expected to do that. Theater companies, arts organizations are not expected to respond to social media as in the way that they're expected to answer the phone or maybe answer a written letter. And at the same time, I think that's gonna change in the next year or two, um, the way it does with that sandwich place. So there's that, but this is what I actually wanna cover. This is the thing, because I actually think we're in a little bit of a food bubble because everybody thinks they're, it's not that everybody thinks, everybody actually, with the food network and everything else, everybody has a lot of knowledge about food, cooking, dining. And so we're in a little bit of a bubble because everybody's sort of got that expertise. And it's, 
it's just all over the place. On top of people are eating foie gras all the time and getting fat, and at some point you realize, I need an experience other than restaurants. And this ties back to where we are today, because I go to a lot of, I've been going to a lot of these types of things in the past six months, and this is the first time I've spoken at one of these. But in the way that I'm saying, you know, the dinner is the show, the answer to that is not to build a cafe in your arts institution. It's not bad. Strange Tree, who's a great theater company in town, has this idea that their ideal would be having a tea house in the front. And that would absolutely, if you've ever seen their shows, would match their sensibility. But what I'm going to say is that a lot of arts organizations, if they want to be social, they'll say, what are we going to do? There's the talk back, the, the post-show discussion, which a lot of artists cringe at, or the pre-show lecture that these are the ways of making a show, the things we've been talking about all day today, interactive, et cetera. And what I'm gonna say is that places like what we're at today, and these are happening all over Chicago under other names than Ted, are the post-show discussion is the show. And you'd be surprised because it's like everybody, it's hard to sit through those post-show discussions. And yet there are a lot of events where we're coming and skipping the show part, and a lot of this has to do with, I would say, presentation versus representation. There's the question of, could you go and see a, you could go and see a play about five police officers, or you could go and see a show where an actual Chicago police officer has been given a format, whether the format is 18 minutes here, or it's given 20 so slides with 20 seconds each, and they have to fill that <coughs> space. It, there are these forms that in the way that it's like, if I said to you guys, each of you write a poem, where do you start? But if I say write a, a poem where the first and the third lines rhyme and the second and the fourth lines rhyme, you'd be able to do it pretty quickly. And I think that's what's happening to experts all over town. And I'll just give a few quick examples. Uh, day before Valentine's Day, and these things are all full to the brim. These are all full to capacity more than a lot of plays I see. Uh, at, the, at Shuba's, they had a Valentine's Day thing where they had a PhD from the University of Chicago, PhD in chemistry, talk about brain chemistry and sex. It was called the science of sex. I could barely, I couldn't get into the room when the lecture was starting. I actually had to come in about 20 minutes late because it was so packed. It was a slideshow about how humans and animals, how brains and bodies function during sex. They offered a little makeout session afterwards was the promise. It was pretty timid, but that's okay. <laughs> but that's promising these things. That's how, I mean, that's what you're competing against if you're with an arts organization because it's an interactive social thing if you want that. Um, there's a thing called Ignite Chicago, which takes place at Catalyst Ranch, which nobody thinks of as an arts organization, but it's a loft space that's mostly designed for, for business people to brainstorm about things. And so it's designed a little bit like a playpen. It's designed in this really fun way. And they also do have things like you could do crafts there on a Saturday morning for 10, 10 bucks. Anyway, that's a thing called Ignite Chicago. That's the entrepreneur community where if you're not interacting with them, you're going to lose them. And this is where the new money is coming into town. And none of these are happening at arts organizations or if they're happening at something like this that's outside of, uh, that's outside of the purview of the large organization. Um, so at Ignite Chicago, you had anybody from two different chemists and science people, one who worked for a makeup company, talking about what they did for a living. You had, um, you had some entrepreneurs basically practicing pitching their businesses. And it was a social event otherwise. And all these things were five minutes long. So it's like, if one didn't connect with you, the next would. Um, there's Pakakucha, which started in 2002 in Japan as something for architects and designers to basically give six minute talks with 20 slides. There's, this sells out martyrs every two months and you've got people like, uh, you've got architects, designers, actually visual artists, musicians, all talking about something where their love and their passion is there. And so if you're putting on a play, it's not that this is gonna make this null and void, but it is something that's competing with you guys right now. And it's not in the arts pages. It's not in the theater pages. It's never, it's not, it's kind of, it's, a, it's not for profit or for profit. At this point, these things are covering their costs. And a little like today where we're exchanging our time for the opportunity to do this, I think some of this is driven by the economy where this is a, though it's also a 19th century idea of betterment, of, of you have a little bit of spare time and you want to do something to know a little more and maybe feel a little better and get inspired. And again, when the job market's scary, 
there's a more of a necessity to that. So it's something between the arts and something else, but it is performance. I mean, I'm a director and I could say, this is how different performances work on stage. These are things that engage an audience versus not. To say that they're not involved in the arts is to be missing a big opportunity. And uh, so here's what, I, I mean, part of it is saying our organizations are closed except for 7 to 10 p.m. most of the time. And yet, if arts organizations were to host these events, not, not just exclusively centered on arts, which I think is important, but I think bring the cop in to do his five minute thing or whatever, it's gonna keep these institutions alive because otherwise it's a little like the conversation at dinner where people are gonna have those conversations, they'll have the experience elsewhere. If these places like Catalyst Ranch start offering memberships, and I think memberships are more powerful than subscriptions, that's where the money's gonna go, that's where the gratitude is gonna go, somebody gets a job, somebody gets a date somewhere else when they could be happening here, almost there. So, and, and I'll skip over something else, but there was a TEDx a few weeks ago at the University of Chicago. Imagine being 20 years old and discovering that there's a way to do performance that doesn't have to do with being in the arts. And because I'll tell you, that event was flooded with hundreds of college kids. And so that's kind of what the future is looking at. That's an opportunity for people who I think used to think they had to go on stage and sing a song or be in a play to perform. Now the idea that you can just be an expert at anything in the world and perform. The way people think of, you know, you can write a book without being thought of as a writer. That's what's happening with performance now. And performing arts organizations would benefit from including that. And otherwise, I'd say go see these things so that you're aware of what the field is in the way that if you run an arts organization, you know what the competition is out there. I'll just end it at that, but I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for staying.